Hi everyone. Um, welcome to Draft Broadcast Live. Um, we were just waiting for everyone to kind of get in and, uh, and, and settled. So my name's Ned McConnell and I'm the curator of Draft. Um, and I'm going to be today talking to Holly Blakey. Hello. Hi Holly. Hi. Um, Holly is a choreographer and artist and director and someone that I've been, whose work I've been an admirer of for a long time. So it's great that we can um, have this, uh, this chat. So to tell you a bit about this uh, series, this is um, in partnership with Performance Exchange. Um, so when we went into lockdown, we had decided uh, we talked to Rose Lejeune from Performance Exchange and we had decided that we wanted to do something to um, kind of support um, people working in, in uh, performance or live and event based work. Um, so and we wanted to kind of keep keep the kind of conversation going around that. So that's what this kind of partnership is about. Um, all of the talks that we're doing and they're every Thursday are then archived on a shared YouTube channel, which is the Draft and Performance Exchange YouTube channel. You can find that out through our website. Um, so yeah, like I said, they're like regular sessions on a Thursday. The times are changing a little bit because, uh, because of people's availability or, um, or whatever. So the next one is Thursday the 30th and that's with Performance Exchange. So that one will be at 10 a.m. Um, because the, one of the speakers is based in Beijing uh, Carol Yinghuan Lu, who's the director of In Out Museum, will be speaking to uh, artist Grace Schwint, uh, and that will be really exciting. So you should tune into that one. Um, so a little bit about the format. So we, uh, Holly and I, are going to talk for about um, about half an hour, maybe, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. And so uh, if you all look at your Zoom screen at the bottom, there's a button which is Q and A. So if you've got questions, you can uh, type them into that and then Holly and I will look at them and we'll try and get through as many as we can at the end. Um, okay, so that's the kind of housekeeping stuff done. Um, so how are you doing, Holly? Yeah, I'm doing good, actually. Good. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I think is good, maybe good to start with um, for you is maybe you can talk a little bit about what you see um, choreography as being for you? Well, it's a huge question. Um, what I see choreography as being for me, well, I don't really ever embark on making anything within mind of it being a choreography or a dance, actually. I, I end up using that format because that's who I am, I suppose. But so I would hope to think that choreography to me is just an infinite, palette of whatever you choose to pick from life and I really try for um, I, I really try for it to be as limitless um, as, as possible um, yeah how did you how did you get into choreography maybe if we start at the kind of the beginning and maybe go through a bit of your sort of journey to where you are now well I sort of started in a more normative kind of contemporary dance world um, by which I mean um, dancing in, in, a, in, a, in a more kind of conventional theatre kind of way and then, I, and then I got into music videos and really I think that my, my choreography started to um, exist more when it, when, it, when it began from that place and so I kind of started doing a lot of music videos and, and, uh, and that kind of morphed more and more into this dialogue between my, my live practice that, that always kind of kept going in tandem really. Um, and and uh, I was really interested actually, initially with how my kind of small c contemporary dance community saw the music video world and was very frowned upon really then. It was, it, you know, I'm, I'm talking a while ago now. So my sort of live work started to reference maybe that sort of snobbery that I found. Um, 
and then I started to sort of make work live work from that place and and it kind of it kind of just carried on from from there really music videos into into live which and I you know I, I do both very much so yeah because it's interesting that you kind of um you say that you really you I guess in terms of your professional life maybe is it fair to say you like you started in uh, music videos even though you had a uh, um, a kind of your roots were in contemporary dance. Yeah, that. yeah, that's exactly. Um, and um, I wonder if, because one thing I feel like there is a lot of within your work is like narr is narrative, um, and I feel like there's a lot. You know, you, you're the, the, there's a kind of storytelling element to a lot of your live work, which is also in a lot of your music video work. Um, I wonder if now is maybe actually a good point to show. Um, to show the Cherry Hill video. Oh, sure, okay, yeah. Um, so that people can kind of get a feel for the type of video direction that you've done. Okay, yeah. So let's watch that. Um, sorry, I just have to do a bit of technical things of sharing screens and things. That's okay. So can, is that good? Can you see that? I can. Can you hear it? I can. Good. A little bit. Ned, it's jumping quite a bit. Is it? Okay. Is it for you? No. Okay, maybe it's me. Ignore me. So I'm getting some messages saying it's a bit glitchy. So that's not glitchy for me. Yeah, so maybe we just uh, go back to the conversation. But if anybody wants to watch that, it's on the Nowness website. And basically, th this was a commission by Nowness um, for you to make a video at um, at this this particular house, right? Yeah, well, it was actually with Nowness and Christie's, the, you know, the auction house. And it was quite interesting, really, because, I mean, I never know how honest to be about this, but it was like a multi-million pound house out in, you know, out in the outskirts of London, about an hour away or something, and uh, lying empty. And they're basically selling this house and, and in order to do that and to create something interesting alongside it you know can you make this film and I guess that I guess you there was something totally soulless about the transaction in many ways it just felt like you know you're given a I, I it's not the transaction with anything by the way other than selling this house I should be clear about that but it just felt to me like there was a lot of sadness in this huge great big building that just mostly lies empty and I mean we're talking so much money that the place is incredible it has a cinema it has a huge big wine cellar it has a swimming pool it has in the film you don't see as much as much as there is and uh I, i'd worked with camille who's the the lead there camille Rowe, in, in a project for dior she's like a dior model basically and 
great, great actor as well. And, you know, I wanted to do this film that somehow harnessed really the most, mostly the sense of loneliness I felt about the whole thing and the, the expense and the sort of, um, I don't know, I just found, I found there to be quite a lot of loneliness and, and misery in it in many ways. And so I wanted to make something with Camille that kind of tried to harness that and um, find a little bit of magic in it too. It's, it's funny really to watch that again because it, it feels like a long time ago and it feels quite, um, quite clean. But, but thank you for, for, for thinking of that one, Ned. What, um, what do you mean by clean when you say? I think it just feels very, when I watch it back now, it feels, feels very clean and polite. But, I, you know, I, you, you sort of hate everything you've ever made in many ways, don't you, I think? Um, yeah, that can definitely happen. Um, I think, you know, with that piece in particular, um, the, so the main character, Camille Rowe, mm. Is she is she a dancer? No, she she's a... not. No, no, she's a model. She's a Dior model, and right. she's been in films. She's yeah, but she she just took to it so well. And the the I did a um, a Dior film with her, and she was dancing in that. So we'd worked in I think we were in Kiev in the freezing cold and minus ten, and we were working in the studio there for like a week or so. Um, me and a group of dancers as well, and. Um, and yeah, and I, I just remembered that she was brilliant and got on so well with her. And I, I really think she's she's amazing, actually. And so I asked her to come and be a part of this project, um, which felt like a very small project compared to how brilliant she is. But fortunately, she agreed to do it. I wonder how, um, what the importance of this, uh, I guess there's quite a kind of, um, slippery porous boundary between um the idea of like a dancer and an actor particularly within some of your work and i wonder like if you could talk a bit about the kind of importance of that or or well i suppose i mean when i look for dancers or or things in or or when I look to dancers, I'm, I'm never really trying to find a sense of unity among them. I'm never really particularly interested in technique or straight lines or beautiful curves so much. In fact, I'm more interested in people and characters. And so in that sense, anyone really could, could do it. Um, not that I don't think the, the company that I work with, that, you know, are, are, are exceptional because they are, but I'm more interested in, in people than I am in dancers really. I mean, I'm, I'm, and that can be dancers too, you know, I'm interested in their narrative and, and uh, I'm interested in what makes them who they are much more than I'm interested in seeing a dancing body. Yes. And uh, like maybe, because I think one thing that's very interesting about your work is the idea of these dancers or actors or, as you say, like bodies and what, what they're bringing to the to the choreography, I guess, or to the piece. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about like how you collaborate with them because it feels like each, each of the dancers is bringing their own um, personal histories or narratives or whatever to the piece. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think that this idea of history and narrative is, is really important. And, you know, in my last live work, especially this idea of what narrative can mean in dance was was quite vital to its to its making. Uh, and I'm interested in that because historically, the use of narrative in dance has a, a very different format into the way in which I wanted to approach it. I wanted to see how responsible it would be or how how irresponsible it would be to take people's actual narrative, their stories and their perhaps trauma or shame or whatever and create narrative from something that felt utterly bespoke to who was there. Um, and, uh, and I guess like with that, you, you know, you kind of, um, you fall upon much worry of responsibility, but, um, you, you, you know, you, it's also this quite liberating space where you, you have a room of people who kind of make a decision to dive into something or not. And, you know, it becomes, becomes very vulnerable and very magic at the same time. And when I'm working with them, 
the process can be, you know, we always say there's a Wednesday when everyone's crying loads and it seemed to happen in this last process that every Wednesday would be hysterical cry day and everyone would cry the whole time. Um, and then we have other days that are quite euphoric and, and um, everything seems to feel quite, um, you know, like a condensed pocket of emotion. The thing is, is although there's much unison in, in my work, actually, because I enjoy this kind of frontal pop video aesthetic, I enjoy that it can feel in your face and, you know, like its eyes are looking straight at you. But I want it to be executed with a sense of narrative and history through everybody who's there. So it shouldn't feel uniform or polite or tidy or neat. It should feel like, um, like clan-like behavior, like a load of people coming together to perform the same dance in union, you know, with their own kind of garbage behind them. And so when we're making stuff, we're, we're, we're pulling from ourselves and from each other and trying to formulate a language that feels kind of, kind of true, you know, if that Yeah, sense. yeah. <laughs> and, um, I wonder, like, so, because I know popular culture is like a big part of your practice because you have so many different influences and so there's so many different references in a lot of your work in particular in the your most recent live piece which was um cow puncher my ass which is which was a two-night show at the south bank center i say ass ned ass i know i know that's the difference between us you see you're salt of the earth i'm a, i'm a southerner <laughs> cow puncher my ass um, which was which was a development of Cow Puncher, which was, yes. which was in 2018, also at the South Bank. Mm. And this idea of um, popular culture and kind of the mashing together of a lot of different kind of references. What, why do you think that's so important to you? The, like this idea to bring in lots of references and not to say, maybe do something that's more like contemporary contemporary dance which which arguably might be a little more simple to to put together i don't think i'm uh why why i do that i think that i want to make work that feels honest and true to who i am and isn't shying away from any part of what what i am and what sort of thing i do and make um i think there's a lot of humor behind who we all are really isn't there and there's um there's something funny and ridiculous about about dancing and there's something very vital about it as well and why on earth do we put music on and dance to it i think that's really funny um why pop videos uh, i i'm not going into something thinking oh, i'm gonna take everything from all these different places I'm, I'm going into something thinking how can i be as brutally honest as possible and how can i you know put myself on the line as much as possible and be as generous as i can be and make this make this make this not about me but at the same time exercise all these things you, you know you, you're you're kind of um you're always trying to fix a problem from before in a way aren't you and you know obsessing over yourself really at the same time while trying to pretend you're not but um i suppose uh i just um i, I guess I, it's just about trying to create something fresh as well isn't it at the same time I don't so, know, do you feel free to interject, Ned, when I'm rambling this way? No, no, I, like, I think it's, I think you're right. And, you know, in terms of, obviously, you're, you're not necessarily coming at it thinking I want to challenge this or do that. But um, I think your, your live work in particular has done that to a certain degree. And <clears throat> I think one thing that I've heard you talk about a bit is, is like context being really important to all the different kind of pieces or bits of work that you do. So, um, you know, for example, I guess if you're working in, um, uh, in video, like doing a music video, that's sort of, you're going to approach that in one way. If you're working live, that's going to be approached in a different way. Um, and like, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot really, because dance is something that is, um, I guess is something which everybody has done, um, unlike some other art forms. Um, it's also something which people watch, but you watch it live. You also watch it on TV or on your computer or whatever, but then you also engage in it yourself, maybe in a club or at a, 
a dance hall or in a class or whatever. So I wonder if you can talk a bit about like that experience and how you try to bring that into or kind of coalesce that within the different ways that you work. Um, the sense of the sort of every day, really. <clears throat> I mean, I think dance is like a process of exorcism of some kind and going to the club is the same thing. And I, and sometimes it feels like, it feels like we just have to dance furiously in order to, in order to connect with one another or to say the things that we want to say, or perhaps not talk actually. Um, I, I think that bringing those things, do you mean that, that I bring those things into the work, this idea of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is, did you hear that bang? Sorry if that made me jump. Yeah, um, no, that's right. So, uh, so can I just stop you there, Holly? I'm aware some people, I think we're still in the screen, screen share. Yeah. Um, let me try and work this out. Bear with me. Right. <laughs> I'm new to technology, so, uh, so am I. stop share. That's okay, it. there we go. Uh, yes, so I'm, I guess I'm interested in how, how you feel about dance and how like communicating, because for me as like a viewer, I guess what I bring to, to dance when I'm watching is like this knowledge that sometimes I do it in public and that's that's like very personal or it's collective but kind of private as in like if I was in a club dancing I love it when you like share little moments with other people on the dance floor and you're kind of like you know just having a great time yeah I obviously I'm never going to go on stage and do it and but there's still something I can connect with around those people on stage who are dancing which I think you don't get from a lot of other art forms yeah, I mean the ultimate goal, isn't it, is to is to sing to people, is to set, is to connect with people, is to feel like you're in a dialogue with one another. You know, I think the best work, or you know, it's like when you read a book and you think this was written for me. You know, I think that the best the best work is when you're having that immediate response and connection, and you know, it's it's guttural, isn't it? And 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 if you're reaching that and you're communicating in that way, I mean that that should be. That's, that, that is the goal for me, at least. So, so it might feel that a lot of the, the work sometimes has, has this quality to it. And absolutely, we're, that is kind of what we're doing, really. It's just like there is no other, there is no other dialogue at this moment apart from, apart from this feeling. And it isn't, it, isn't, uh, it isn't formed. It's just like this is how this should feel. Now, you know, go loud music and it's just you know it's clan like it's tribal should it that's that's how it should be yeah yeah and i guess speaking of that kind of idea of clan like or being tribal you you collaborate a lot um on your on your work um you know with uh cow puncher you collaborated with mika mika levi and um with Did stella you? mccartney Vivian Westwood. Vivian Westwood, sorry. Um, can you maybe you can, maybe you can talk a bit about that? Yeah, about I mean, it's, it's funny that? because um, people often like to talk about collaboration in in and and I've been very very fortunate with people who I've collaborated with. Um, but I mean, all kind of dance has costume and music, so I, I don't think there's something unique that I'm that I'm doing there. I've been very lucky with the people I, I collaborate with, um, working with Mika. Has, has been actually quite like a long journey now um, we've done quite a few different bits together and obviously continued this journey into the second incarnation the second cow puncher um, and that 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 was an amazing process where by you know they would film it a lot like you would you, uh, score it a lot like they would a movie you know they'd film it take it back to the studio write on it bring it back we'd take the music we'd re-rehearse and it kind of had this to and fro. We wanted the process to feel like you would do in a movie basically. Um, and uh, that's quite different to, for example, when I collaborate with, with Gwillem or with, you know, Darkstar or whatever, where there is um, a slightly sort of different process 
um, you know, it just change, changes on accord to who you're collaborating with. Um, equally, you know, with, with Vivian Westwood, they just, I mean, with Westwood already, they, they have this very strong cowboy aesthetic that just seems to marry and align very much with how you might be able to reform what the cowboy could be and create a new conversation around it. So that was already sort of, you know, that was already ticking along and felt like a, a great thing to harness. And we were super lucky to be able to work with them. So um, just for some, a bit of context. So um, Cow Puncher and Cow Puncher My Ass it was, um, is a kind of a play around the idea of the Western and cowboys and gender and the kind of um, intonations and the kind of gestures of those, of that genre. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly cowboy, uh, cowboy, I think cow puncher were, felt like it, we wanted, I, at that time I wanted to create a Western. I've never even been into Westerns particularly. I don't really know how it started. Um, I, I, I just, I fell in love with this idea of the cowboy and, and how you could have this super ultra alpha male versus this incredible gay icon. and. How, how humorous and funny that felt. And it also, you know, the more I looked into spaghetti westerns and the idea of the western, the more it felt like, in fact, we were living in one. It's all about racial divides. It's all about carving out borders. It's, it's toxic masculinity. Um, women appear hardly at all in many. Look, I'm not a, I'm not a western expert at all, but I, I found that there were so many, so many little things that felt like interesting things to start to look at and in fact actually with the second show which is entirely different it's a new show it's not the same from there I, you know I, I it became a lot more about our desire to connect with one another and, and our obsession of of uh, our obsession of of being in the group and feeling wanted really my biggest goal actually with cow punch in my ass which I would never say we achieved was, you know, it should feel more like the Sopranos in a way. I think the Sopranos was like the greatest thing ever made. And, and, and like the Sopranos in what way? Well, the Sopranos is like this incredible story of therapy and masculinity and family and violence and shame and sex and drugs and, to be honest, I think it, it, it's just one of the best things ever made. And, and uh, you know, if any, if any of my work could ever feel a bit like that, I would, I would aim for Sopranos. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with you. It's one of my favourite um, favorite TV programmes ever. And, you know, I guess one thing I've always thought about The Sopranos is like this, that it has this, there's like a Greek tragedy to it almost in, in every episode, you know, it's like it's so kind of epic in the in in its drama but then it's also um contained within this very domestic sphere yeah yeah and you you know you 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 think you're watching something but you're understanding and living in something else and so so nuanced and exquisite and sometimes nothing sometimes just carmella and tony just hang out in the kitchen and you're just like whoa it's just yeah. too much it's too brilliant <laughs> it's so subtle it's so incredible and and um you know and then the other thing is you've got to remember is all these things you speak a lot of you know all these things they're referencing life aren't they it's all it's all just life it's all just that's what the magical beautiful thing is so really you can always just look 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 around isn't it now like i think one thing so we we did a talk a live talk with nina Bayer a couple of weeks ago and one of the things that we were talking about um, quite a lot is this the kind of slippages between um, the subject and the object where you know particularly in things like performance or in acting where the person is both the subject and the object because they're obviously acting like someone but they might be crying and they're crying real tears but they're crying they're also crying fake it's fake emotion Mm. Um, and I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit around that because you because you use so many references and your dancers are both dancers and kind of actors as well because mm. you're asking them to kind of fill these sort of character roles. Well, you know, some sessions will be these. The movement 
and the way the show is constructed isn't just made from one idea or one sort of process with as many different things in which build it but one of those things might be a really sort of you know cards on the table it might start as a real cards on the table um, improvisation whereby we use the space and we all stand outside the space and we have to go in but we have to read what is necessary it's not it's not a it's not a new technique it's 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 go, it's go in read what's needed in the space do it indulge as much as you have to but understand that you're carving a bigger thing than just yourself this is something we might do all the time uh, to start getting into how things feel or whatever and so sometimes it can I'll, I'll be talking a lot or talking to individuals or saying things about myself and I think sometimes it's key and, and what I certainly try to do with the the last cow puncher was um make myself as vulnerable as possible as I said earlier mm. so that means telling things about myself that I feel shame attached to or whatever that might be and these things and these dialogues and stories that we might say uh start to come out through the body now you know those moments aren't rehearsed and they're not false and they're not acted. They're, they're, they're real responses to what's existing at that time. And you can't, you can't necessarily recapture or re-harness that because it's immediate and it's in your face and it's on accord to that day and the weather and who you're with. But we might, we might film some of that or we might talk afterwards about what that was and see if there's a way to 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 re-meet it so see if there's a way to actually take that movement take what happened there but eventually you kind of have to take all the emotion out of it because you can't it's not you can't perform that level of of uh, I, I you you can but in 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 my work i don't think that you can necessarily on stage go to that sort of emotional place um every single time i think you have to learn how to perform it as a as an actor might yeah, yeah i mean i don't know what would happen to you you'd have a breakdown <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean that makes total sense um so i wonder if it's a good moment to open it up to questions or just before we do that we can go through some stills of cow puncher because we've talked about that quite a bit so i wonder if that's maybe a nice thing to do sure. And this should be much more. Um... So maybe, Holly, do you want to talk us through these images? You know I mean, I don't really have much to say about them, particularly yeah. that Daniele uh, Fumo, a real friend of mine who um, has captured actually almost everything I've done, uh, came and, and, uh, and shot these. This is from a section called Swing, I think. Um, and yeah, there's Johnny, Naomi, Tyler at the back. Um, yeah, that's from Cowpuncher, the second one. Uh, Gracie, Cowpuncher my ass. There she is. This is the closing moment of the show. Uh, this piece is called Baby Girl and uh, it's after she's, she sees the sort of finale basically and she dances under a sort of snow dome at the end and the final moment is her perfect butt. Yeah, this is the cast. Yeah, Fab. Tyler. This is, uh, yeah, this idea of oral fixation, which was something that was a theme a bit through the work, the idea of the mouth. And after having my son and seeing in a different way how obsessed with the mouth, I, we talked a lot about how you're led and guided I mean, I see him crawling around and everything is touched with the mouth. Everything goes in the mouth. And this idea of oral fixation basically came into discussion in the work. And, um, you know, bulimia, smoking, kissing, everything through the mouth. It's just quite a theme that we talked quite a bit about. There's Tyler again. There's another moment there. Okay. Um, have you got anything you want to add, Holly, before we really? go to the questions? Let's have a look and see what we've got. So, uh, first up, Jessica Graves says, how do you think of engaging with creating dance work virtually as physical distancing measures continue? 
how do you think we'll see the medium evolve? I don't know, and I, 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 I don't know. I, I'd like to think that something magical and beautiful will happen. The thing that I rely so much on in, in, in dancing is, is nearness and touch and bodies. And so it's quite sort of, it's quite awful really uh, to feel so, like that's the one thing that we can't use. Um, I'm still sort of undergoing a process of understanding what this is and, you know, you, you have really good days, don't you, and really bad days. I, I, I can't answer that. I, I have no idea what's going on. If anyone else does, they can <laughs> shout. Um, okay, so um, are there, Lucy Cowling is just asking if there's any more touring plans for Cow Punch My Ass? Well, there were. And right. now I don't know. There were many, many great plans for the show. And now I really don't know because I can't imagine we can have, I don't know when the next time is we'll be able to have all those people together um, in the same space. So that feels pretty tragic. That feels quite heartbreaking. But at the same time, I'm, I'm very grateful to have had the show just before this happened because, you know, it's, it's an exorcism. It's something I felt so, so necessary to do. And, uh, and I feel really lucky that we, we got to do that. But yeah, so I, I, I don't know right now. Was, was, the, was it always part of the plan to do the second development of it? No, 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 no. Uh, no, it wasn't at all. But equally with how films and, and other very, very important forms of uh, culture have this idea of season or episode, I quite liked the fact that it could have more iterations. Um, Sophie Catherine is just asking you if you can talk a bit more about the creative process for... Um, I thought you were going to say it's asking if you can just talk a bit more loudly. No, go on. Um, just talk a bit more about the creative process for Cow Punch My Ass and Cow Puncher. Yeah, I mean, it was a long journey that started, obviously, I think probably around 2017 or 2018. And, and it had also different dancers come in and out of the space. So um, we had a lot of shared dialogue with different people. All of the sections in the piece, although they might not be clearly sections to other people, they're all they're very clear sections to me. Uh, it starts with um, it starts with fuck. What was that called now? Lake of Souls. It's the beginning part, and so uh, that that came from a moment where we were carving out the the space and using the the ground itself as. Um, bad uh, as a way in which to kind of form and create narrative this area is a bad area this area is a good area can we do like a shootout you know and we 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 kind of started really simply and from that place but as as it developed and um and as you start to read context and also what language is being born from what you do you know you, you shift direction and you shift place so there's a section called line dance. You know, this section is about creating and reforming and trying to re-understand what a line dance can be with all of our dialogue and history. One of the final sections is called the work. This was the therapy section. This was how we could try and understand or re, re kind of um, replace all the trauma from before. Um, and so it has this kind of slow walking section where the heads shake. Um, and it actually leads into this, this moment where essentially Chester is kind of coerced off the stage, pushed into his own suicide, if you will. And so each, each section, each moment of narrative informs obviously what happens next. And often we would write down, okay, what are our symbols here? What are we seeing here? What, 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 is, what has gone on before and after? And, Again, like you said, Ned, this sense of narrative, especially in those two works, really when story was vital, when you were thinking about how you could re reimagine what narrative could be in the contemporary dance stage, but also in this Western, in this movie that we were putting on stage. So the idea of story and ensuring that each character knew what their narrative was and their role was within the work helped shape and form what would happen. Uh, yeah. Great, super interesting. Um, so Sophie actually has a, a very short follow-up question, which is what do you look for when searching for new dancers or artists to work with? Uh, I, I think that, um, 
I think that it's about it's about seeing someone who is um, really unashamed to to be whatever it is that they are, and that and uh, and that that's the wonderful thing about people, isn't it? There's only one of you. It's just so so often we're too sort of afraid to be that or follow follow a status quo or you know contouring. I mean, I do it. And I think that the thing that excites me the most about people is when they're utterly themselves. Mm. Um, yeah. So uh, Anouk Joanne has asked or says, I found your decision to keep the lights in the audience during Cowpunch on My Ass so, effective and vi so effectively and violently impactful while breaking and sort of erasing the fourth wall between the performers and audience i wonder where that decision came from that decision happened at 11 o'clock at night the night before we opened the show <laughs> we had a whole lighting set up for the whole front end of the show and mika and i were sat in the audience with with edward doing you know looking at this and and we all just said to each other this just doesn't feel right. And you see, the thing is, what happens is you, you make all this work in a, in a studio or whatever, and you're, you're, you're sat together and, and the way in which you experience it is, is much more immediate than it would be when you're in a theatre space. And it's, you know, the QH is huge. And I, and I just, I felt overwhelmingly, like we all did, that it didn't feel immediate enough. Immediate enough. It didn't feel traumatic enough. I didn't see myself in it enough. It was too clean or polished or something wasn't right. And, um, you know, when all the lights are on, you feel yourself in the space as an audience member, you see who sat next to you, you feel that the whole time. And I wanted it to feel as arresting in that way as possible. I wanted the audience to feel, uh, I, I guess, themselves, really. Uh, and, I, and, you know, then when the lights did change, I, I felt myself that the lights went black and then there was a sort of rush that happened. And, and then that's when we felt like we'd made the right decision really for me, you know, for, for what I wanted to achieve. And then you, you have the sweet spot when the lights are being as elegant as they, as they can. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Francisca Lopez is asking, what advice do you have for starting filmmakers in terms of working with people's stories and our own personal stories to spark that brutal honesty and connect with the audience? I don't really have, um, I don't really have advice as a filmmaker because um, I don't feel very experienced as a filmmaker necessarily, but in terms of making work and actually I approach everything that I do in exactly the same way, whether it be um, choreography for film or for live or whatever, or working with an artist. I actually approach all of those things in exactly the same way. Um, I don't think one is more exclusive, better or whatever than the other. I think that you, as, as with, I guess the way I think about it is, is that you have to be kind and you have to be sensitive and, and you have to gain trust. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm too kind and sensitive, actually, in fact, and sometimes you think that, you know, sometimes the best work is when people aren't being fucking kind or nice about anything, are they? You know, it's... I no, always think about uh, that film, Blue is the Warmest Colour, you know, when there's that incredible seven minute long sex scene in it. And it's really, really amazing and really beautiful, but I think was one of the most horrendous things to make, you know, I don't know if you've heard this, you probably yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. And I and and where the women felt you know horribly exploited and I, I, it was actually one of the most amazing remarkable things I'd seen. So wh where does responsibility lie? I don't know, but I think so long as you can form trust with each other and let yourself be vulnerable too, like let your stories be there too. Hopefully, you'd think that would be a good place to start. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. It, it's about the well, A, the, the levels of trust, and B, I think, how vulnerable can you make yourself as the kind of uh, director of, of, of all of this? You know, there has to be some, some level of kind of parity with the people that you're asking to do certain things, you know. Um, so, Kira Blakey <laughs> is asking, um, what inspires you? What inspires me? 
Um, I think I think the everyday inspires me actually. Like Kira will know exactly what I mean, and I know that she feels the same way too. But sometimes it's just the way a little old man might open a sandwich box, or the way my son will pat the cat, or the you know I'm, I everyday things I, I, are are the most breathtaking, aren't they? And it's almost sort of harking back to what I was saying earlier, that you forget that all the time, in fact, these things you're referencing are life. You know, the beautiful blossom on the trees now. You know, these things are, are real. And, you know, sometimes it's things as simple as nature shows or the Sopranos, or, you know, sometimes we talk about the shoe bill. I, I really love this brutal, brutal bird. It's sort of like a crane-like prehistoric bird in various places in you know wetlands in in africa that tropical wet climate is is i always think where i should be like the most beautiful climate and yet in this space is the most brutal horrible bird that you know <laughs> you ever heard about the shoe bill no shall i tell you i don't yeah, i'm not an expert definitely. but no, no, definitely. the shoe bill will will sort of birth too young and one of them, one of them is, is, is merely an insurance policy, basically. And, and the, the parent, the mother will feed both until she sees one becomes weaker. And I, I saw this, this amazing footage where the mother went to the water to pick up water. The stronger shoe bill attacked the other one. And then as she came back, the mother, she saw what happened. And rather than help the young, she just stepped over it and fed the water to the other one. Oh. And, and this poor, this poor bird eventually just dies. And, and you can't believe that nature has this extreme, brutal reality to it. And it's yeah. things like that. It's things like that that inspire me, I think. Uh, so Kira's got a, a little follow-up question as well, so I'll just do this before we get into our other ones. Uh, she says, you've spoken about the dance world being old-fashioned or out of touch. How does it compare to working in the visual arts and how do you traverse these different worlds? Um, thank you, sis. I, I just think that, you know, people in the dance world have often said that I'm trying to be shocking. I think there's absolutely nothing shocking going in my going on in my work whatsoever. And if I speak to people who are from a from an art, you know, background, <clears throat> I find it a just much more open place. No one there, no, no one's shocked there. There is this openness, and there is a sense of um, acceptance. Maybe it is that just feels a, that just feels slightly more. Um, a, slightly more liberated than, than the dance world. And I think there's something in, in this, the, the beautiful history of dance that stems from these very particular set of rules that I find so beautiful and so sort of tragic and amazing. You know, this, this is the first position and my leg will go as high as it possibly can. And how beautiful and sort of ridiculous is that? And I just think it's incredible. But I also think what sort of stems from that mentality is this sort of watered down idea of what things can be really if you don't follow the rules it's not really dance if it's not quite like that you're not really doing a dance and i just feel like this 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 sort of thing is quite an institutionalized idea and i think that it stems through a lot of problems that exist in what contemporary dance is or can be and i don't find those problems in the art world actually i find it to be a lot more open i'm sure there are many issues that go on in the art world i'm no expert in any of it i just try and move between what feels right in the, t the time for me you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so we've got five more questions, um, and then I think we'll we'll finish after that. So Kate Davies says, "I love the Sopranos reference; it feels so fitting for Cowpuncher. Can you tell us about any other such direct popular culture influences or references for other work that you've done?" Oh, uh, I don't know really now. I mean. I don't know. I, I don't know. I love I love music videos. I can't really think of, uh, of of anything. I mean, I feel like Sopranos took quite a long time to watch. That engaged my mind for quite a long time. Um, I I I, uh, I don't know if there are any specific other pop, pop culture references. I, I I'm. Okay. Uh, so Anna Lee's Hearn. Sorry. Said, about that. No, no, it's all right. 
how do you overcome or move through setbacks or resistance faced in the process of bringing a piece or an idea together? Well, you know, you, 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 you're, you're suddenly like, your work becomes your sort of child, doesn't it? And you're always faced with, with so many things, so many obstacles and problems, whether it's money or health or um, institutional sort of bollocks or whatever. And I, I think, you know, you, you have to know that if you're, if you're doing your best and working as hard as you can and, and you're listening to people and you're talking to people and you're, you're reading and you're, you're being the best version of yourself that can, that can articulate the thing that you want the most and that can, you, you're going to come across problems all the time. I think you just, I try and be consistent and I try and be consistent with other people and understand that things just fucking happen and you can't control everything. You know it's life right it's life <laughs> um so electra junta says what's the most useful advice you've ever been given most useful advice i've ever been given um it was something um something my sister said to me where she said everyone isn't thinking about you the whole time you know that was useful Okay, good. Ned, come on, this is very poignant stuff. It she is. Said, it is. No, I'm trying not to be biased because I know I know Kira very well, and it sounds exactly like something. I think what she basically <laughs> meant was, you spend so much time thinking that the world thinks about you in such a way, and no one's thinking about you at all. So shut the fuck up. That's well, what she no, meant. I think I think that's very good advice because I think especially if you have um, a public kind of persona or you. Or, or like yourself, particularly put yourself up there, you know, for in the public so kind of viscerally, I think it's very easy to become, to, 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 to lose perspective of that, you know? Yeah. Um, so Matt Nightingale says, you've collaborated with some incredible musicians, designers, artists and dancers, but who would you most like to work with in the future? Uh, Beyonce. <laughs> I think. Wouldn't we, wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? Yeah, I would love to work with Beyonce. That's um, a definite must on the list. I wanted to get tickets the um, to her sister's show, but um, I I logged on to get tickets at like seven o'clock in the morning, and there was already a queue of fifteen hundred people. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't. Do that, but, um, at least you didn't didn't queue for too long because it's probably not happening anyway is it right yeah well i guess so um, katinka malimer says when talking in the beginning about directing these frontal facing images confrontational in the most positive ways i'm wondering if seeking kinship is something you are interested in as a device of viewing that evades issues of agency seeking kin seek can you say say it again Ned, please yeah, yeah sure so when you were talking about the these kind of frontal facing images at the beginning at the beginning of the talk or at the, the beginning of, of the talk uh-huh um she's wondering if uh seeking kinship is something you're interested in as a device of viewing that evades issues of agency well i just want i i want the uh, all of the dancers to feel like they have agency and i think sometimes having something that allows for eye contact and, and for a sense of confidence is, is a very simple way in which to achieve that. Um, I think that, I think that it's all, always about the dancers having agency. Uh, although, although, you know, you create choreography and I, they're never vessels, they're never bodies in which I enforce specific things onto. I'll choreograph material and I'll give it to them, but it's always about the way they all, they'll, you know, shift it and make it their own, of course. Um, no, and I think, you know, w when you were talking a bit about the process of working with them earlier on, that was quite clear as well. You know, the, the, the idea of that you had some spaces for improvisation and using that as a kind of starting point to develop things with the dancers rather than writing a kind of score and then asking them to perform it. 
Yeah, and I mean, like I said, there's there's not one route in which we follow. There's many different ways, and, and sometimes it will depend on how we feel. And you know, sometimes maybe we'll we'll have gone to the pub for a long time, and that will that will inform what happens the next day. Or you know, or you know, sometimes there might be a there might be more of a score. There might be okay, the space is being carved this way, and whatever. But but you know, always they should they should uh, they should have agency definitely. Okay, there's two more questions left, but Marie Claire, I think we've answered your um, your question already. So we'll just do this last one, which is from Samil uh, Zenit Iriel Iriel Maz. Sorry if I've got your name wrong. Uh, while talking about your work and dance, you mentioned funny or humorous a lot. Um, what is it that making dance so funny? I think it's not dance that's funny. I think it's life that's funny. I think that um, it's sometimes about encapsulating the mundane and, and the quiet and the humorous and, and being able to laugh at ourselves. And that's both about me being able to laugh at myself as well as an artist, as a, as a pop video maker, as a, as a person, as a, as a woman. But it's also um, about the dancers doing the same thing and, and about life and about how all those things are sort of tiring and uselessly funny. And, and I think that sometimes that's, that's where beauty lies, isn't it? That's how we cope. That's what's gorgeous about life. And so yeah. I think all those things should feel part of the work. Maybe a more pertinent question is what's making dance so serious? That's the big question, babe. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, there's so much amazing dance being made right now and, and, and the lines of which it exists are changing and blurring and context, context is shifting and a lot more people are doing pop videos and where the line sits is very much shifting. And, you know, I, I, I taught uh, the, the, one of the graduate pieces at the place at the end of last year, which was something that as an artist of my background would never have been able to do, you know, three or four or whatever years ago. It's changing, it's shifting, people are moving with with uh with with what's going on and sort of interesting is i can't remember who asked that question before like what next what's going to happen now it'd be interesting to see what those next things are in this age of not having togetherness as well yeah i mean i think i think you're right i think it's super exciting that the shifting of these kind of um boundaries or blurring of these boundaries around dance and the different contexts that it can appear in yeah. okay anything else to add no just thank you and I hope uh, I hope everyone wasn't too bored and thank you very much for asking me thank you Holly it's been really really, really great talking to you um and yeah thank you and I hope if anyone wants to reach out to me I'm always around to chat and just to say I'm sorry some of the the video didn't work out but if you just search for Holly online you can find lots of examples of her videos and images and things if you want to find out a bit more about her all right so yeah like i said next thursday is um carol ying hua lu and grace schwint at 10 a.m so um look out for the uh, messages from performance exchange about that all right bye everyone thank you